Michael, thank you for taking time being with us today. Tell us a little bit, bit more regarding your background and how did you get into real estate? Well, I got into real estate because I was seeking financial freedom, right? That's kind of what, what we're all about. And there's different ways to achieve financial freedom. And I th thought at a time uh, when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad back in 2004, <clears throat> my idea, I had a bunch of uh, money from a software IPO, IPO. And the author, Robert Kiyosaki, talks about uh, a cash flow business business and or real estate. And I said, that's great. My cash flow business is going to be a series of, of restaurant franchises because I knew a bunch of guys who were in that and they're like, oh, this is, we hired a guy, he's going to run everything. And we would just sit back and, and count the passive income. I said, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> so at the time, I wasn't really thinking of real estate. My big idea was to plow my net worth into these restaurants. I had enough to maybe fund four or five restaurants and they would then sell fund and I had a 20 unit plan. So Fast forward to 2013, and I had uh, my restaurants were losing $10,000 per month. And uh, since then, I've been trying to extricate myself and lost about 95% of my net worth through that experiment. So that thing goes so well. Okay. And I've done a bunch of other stuff as well. I'd, I've done uh, real estate, I did house flipping. I flipped, flipped about three dozen houses. I had an apartment building at one point. I was looking at Texas and, and Washington, D.C., I had a short sale negotiation company. So I really did a lot of, lot of things and uh, experimented with a lot of things. I think I traded options for about 18 months. That was kind of fun. Learned a lot of stuff. So I've done a lot of things, seen a lot of things. Uh, some things worked, uh, some things didn't. But there's only one thing that really uh, checked off all the boxes with regards to the uh, kind of permanent retirement I was looking for in a passive kind of lifestyle. Um, with the right risk profile, okay, and that's multifamily. Out of all the things I've done consistently, it's uh, it it checks all the boxes. It's uh, it's readily financing is readily available. Banks are ready to throw money at you at ridiculous low interest rates. The pro the risk profile of multifamily is lower than any business I've ever seen. If you look at the way multifamily performed in two th in the recession, uh, you know the default rates for uh, single family houses was four to 10%, depending on who you ask. And the fall rate for multifamily was 0.04%. It was tiny, 0.4%. <laughs> that includes California and, and Florida. So if you, if you move those two, uh, the default rate was almost zero, right? And that's because people usually, not in class A, but class B, B and C, people have a place, need a place to, to live and the cash flow uh, covered those. So the, the risk profile is, is fantastic. And on the other hand, the returns are, are far above what we can get normally in, you know, in, in the stock market. I mean, we're turning, depending on the kind of deal, anywhere between 10 or 15% average annual return over, let's say, the five-year span of the project. So you, you couple the, the returns with the risk profile, and it's, un, it's unprecedented, right? And, and again, you could put a professional manager in place. So, you know, uh, number one, me as a syndicator is not involved day to day. Uh, I can do a lot more deals. I can uh, provide opportunities for a lot more investors in that way. And I get a much better result. I mean, I'm pretty smart, uh, but I don't really want to manage property. And frankly, I'm probably not really that good at it, right? But the professional managers, uh, you know, are really, really good at it. And, and so you have this, this business model already baked in that you don't have anywhere else. And so this is why after doing a bunch of experimentation, I've really focused on multifamily. And, and I'm, today I'm teaching other people how to do the same thing with a focus on raising money in syndication. And for, for people, I understand you come from Germany, I'm, I'm from Portugal. So for people that are used to kind of a, a, a brick and mortar buildings here in Portugal, apartment buildings, what's the main difference between one typical building, apartment building here and a multifamily building in the US? Is there some uh, important differences? I don't know. I don't know the Portuguese market, uh, and and I don't. I'm not actually intimately familiar with with a, a German multifamily either. Uh, though my observation has been is that the principles are exactly the same anywhere you go, right? Even the tax laws are somewhat simple with depreciation. The government is incentivizing investors to provide uh, housing, and uh, and the principle is is from where I'm sitting, uh, I think very similar. I think some of the details and the laws are 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 different. But the idea is the same way, right? You have this large building and a, a, a variety of investors pool the money together to purchase this building. Someone runs it and we all share no profits, right? That principle is the same. Again, some of the laws are going to be, the details are going to be different, but the principle is, is, is very much the same. We've, we've been speaking with a lot of syndicators lately and we've getting some feedback that the market is reaching all-time highs. 
And regarding cap rates are getting a little bit compressed. What are your thoughts on this? Do, do, are you able to get some deals now? And you, you agree you're sitting on dry powder. What's your take on this, Michael? Uh, yes and yes. It is getting harder to find deals, but yes, we're doing deals. But, but here's, here's a reality, right? So, so cap rates are compressing. People are overpaying. Uh, there's a lot of cash on the sidelines because of the uncertainty, the up and down in the stock market. There's a lot of foreign capital chasing U.S. Uh, real estate. And so people are frankly overpaying. Now, the key for us is that, uh, number one, we need, high, we, we need a high uh, reliable deal flow and we can't compromise our investment criteria, right? So we can't say, where well, we're going to overpay just so we can get into a deal. That doesn't make any sense. Now, we might be able to relax our criteria with regards to maybe the geography, right? I can't say, I want a 14 and a half, you know, I, I want a, a 75 and a half unit building in Knoxville, Tennessee. You know, I, I might be searching a long time for that particular, what I might, but I might say, look, I'm going to consider multiple geographies. Now for us, we have a unique situation because of my educational platform. So late last year, I rolled out a joint venture partnership program to my, my I guess, my ecosystem of people who or my students who use some of my tools where I basically said, look, you find a deal. Here's how. Here are my criteria and I'll raise all the money. And the first deal that we got from that was early in the year. And we closed on that in mid-April. It was a 69 unit in Memphis. And since that was publicized, the floodgates have kind of, kind of opened up. And it's clear to me that uh, there are deals out there. Now, I have the benefit of having several thousand people looking for deals now, right? I give them the analysis tool. And there's now a program called the Dealmakers Mastermind program that allows people to upload their analysis, get feedback. And then there's a, prog uh, there's a sequence of paid calls that qualify the deal, okay? And once the deal bubbles up, it's then presented to our equity company called Nighthawk Equity, kind of like the Shark Tank. <laughs> you know, and so it's, and there's a process up there and a lot of it that never makes it that far. Uh, but right now we have close to 700 units over six deals that are at or close to, uh, at contract. We have a pipeline of about another 1500 uh, deals. And so and my takeaway, sure, sorry, go, go, my go takeaway, on, go ahead. No, go, you go ahead. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> my, my takeaway from that is that there are deals out there but they're not gonna fall in your lap, okay? So there's people out there that are beating the bushes, they're talking to brokers, they're earning their trust, and maybe they're getting that, that call with the off-market deal. Hey, I'm about to list this thing next week, and want you to take a look at it. And that's only because of the, they're, they're we're working with this broker, maybe they've they met him a couple times, looked at a couple properties, they passed on it, and now this broker has a short list, okay? And that's how people are getting the inside track on some of these, and we're seeing this all over the place. And so we have a national outlook. So we're going to go wherever the deals are. Now, we have assets in certain places. Uh, we own about 2,000 units in, in Texas, Georgia, uh, and now in Memphis. We're really uh, getting into Memphis a lot. Uh, but we've, we're, we have some deals in the pipeline, Oklahoma City, Houston, uh, Cincinnati, right? So there's, there's activity all over the country. And we're just going to go wherever the deals are. Now, we're going to have an advantage in certain geographies because we're already there. And if not... We're going to have to learn the market, build a team there just like everybody else does, right? That's, that's kind of our advantage as a national outlook. And regarding, regarding the criteria for, for the, the deals, what are you looking for? Tell us a little bit IRR, cash on cash, uh, that yield, uh, break-even ratio, run us through the numbers. Yeah, so, so we have some, some minimal guidelines and, and minimal, and, and when I say minimal, there's, we'd like to beat those things, but really we want to return an average of 10 to 15% per year over the life of the investment, which is totally five years, right? So five years, normally we have a liquidity event in year five, either a sale or refinance. Uh, the, the, my favorite scenario is a refinance, right? And return the majority of the investor's capital, 60, 80%, whatever that case may be, 100%. And then we just hold on to it and everybody continues enjoying cash flow, right? And the risk is off the table. So 10 to 15% average annual return. We really want to have a cash an average cash on cash return for the first five years of 9%. So if you do an average across the board, it may start off, let's say it's a value add deal. It might start off, uh, you know, very low 4% cash on cash. Year two then is 9%. Year three is 12%. Year four is 14%, whatever. But if I want an average of that, I want at least 9% average cash on cash return. And I really want to be at a 10% cash and cash return run rate in year three, because that's when I want to achieve a stabilization. So I don't want to have to refinance in year five. Who the heck knows what happens in, in year five. I'm going to do it sooner rather than later. So those are generally uh, what we're looking for. Non-recourse loans, obviously. Um, and and we, we stay away from rural areas. And re regarding uh, states that are landlord friendly, how many typical, the minimum, the minimum typical building that you will set in your criteria 
Well, at the minimum is, is really enough to, to qualify for a non-recourse loan, which normally means that you need a loan balance of a, of a million dollars to, to do that. Uh, you talked about landlord friendly states. Yes, we stay away from Washington DC where I own assets and I really don't like it at all. And I've heard California is about the same or worse. It's bad. I mean, it, it's so bad that it takes, it takes you six months to evict someone. If someone's smart, they can be in there for 18 months, uh, you know, and, and in Memphis, for example, you know, it's 21 days and they're out, you know, they're not paying the rent, they're out. Uh, and so, so we're very sensitive to, to the, to the landlord tenant laws. So your, your strategy is basically a value, a value add deal, right? So you, you take another performing asset, see so usually is typically mismanaged and you turn the thing around and you run us through the numbers like you did. What I wanted to, to know is, let's say a broker sends you a deal that you run through your, your calculator and everything is, is, is acceptable but the operation expenses that are way too high, they are, let's say like in a 69 or 70% range. Would you accept that deal knowing that you can actually do something there to decrease the expenses? Well, it depends. Uh, typically in, an, in, in, that, in that scenario, uh, I mean, expenses normally are gonna be between 50 and 55%. So if someone has a 70% expense ratio, that's usually an opportunity, right? So, uh, so for example, you know, a deal we bought in Memphis, uh, the, it was, it was pseudo self man. It was self managed, but he had a very heavy staff there. So the owners managed it himself. He, managed, he wasn't paying a management fee, but he had heavy staff for 69 units. He had a full-time leasing agent and a full-time, uh, maintenance person. I mean, for 69 units, that's outrageous. He had like eight, $90,000 of payroll right now. We underwrote the deal with his payroll. That was his expense and it was high, right? So yeah, the expenses did come in are like 65%, but that's his own damn fault. Right. So when we're going to go in there and we're going to put a professional management company in there, who's, you know, five minutes away from the, uh, from the property manages everything from the office and maybe has an onsite resident manager. Well, our, our payroll is going to be substantially less than that. And that's our benefit right now. We're improving, improving the NOI of the building. Back to the point where you're saying earlier, we don't necessarily need a value add deal. The best deal in the world is someone has already had cash flow and we don't need to, we don't need to do a darn thing. Right. So that's ideal. Uh, again, if that's all I'm looking for, my deal flow is going to be very slim. Now, as it so happens, this deal in Memphis was one of those things. It was actually, frankly, a bit mispriced. I'd say about $200,000 below. We bought it for 2. Uh, I think 2.2, 2, 2, and it should have been priced probably uh, higher than that. So the cash flow going in was incredibly high from day one, and there's nothing we need. There's no improvements. There's no distress at all. Now, on the other hand, we're doing a 220-unit building, which is a very, very heavy value add, Okay. So a lot more work, a lot more risk. The returns are higher. Um, uh, but, but again, the ideal scenario is that you don't have to do anything at all and you're getting a great 13% average annual return. That's awesome. Uh, that's ideal. Now, you know, so you, you kind of have to take it how it comes. So we're very flexible with that. Uh, we'd like to see the returns a bit on the higher end if we're going to do a, a heavy lift or value add. And then it can be a little lower if it's stable going in. And also, sometimes we get some deals regarding, um, sometimes the brokers send you some sketchy financials. And usually, always, always uh, sketchy. Yeah, interest expense, it's like not in the same place. So you kind of, what's this line here? So do you look at those types of deals? You, you, you keep pushing until you get the right numbers. How do you act on those deals? Yeah, um, so, so, so the financials are... Financials always look good on the performer when you get to the deal, right? It makes, it makes a lot of sense. But there's, there's some signs that uh, are, are giveaways that it might be, might be a deal, right? So, um, for example, if the deal is marketed as a value-add opportunity, that piques our interest, right? So, that's, that, that, that piques our interest because a lot of them are already very well-polished and a lot of investors want a well-polished deal. And they don't really want to do a lot of work, a lot of risk, and they're okay with lower returns, right? And, and we, we want to push the envelope. Uh, a little bit, right? So if something has a value a deal, we'll, we'll dig into it a little, a little bit. The other thing also is, you know, the key to our team, as experienced as we are, um, and, and, and we, again, we do have some local knowledge now in several markets, but nevertheless, we rely heavily on our team, specifically the property managers. And this is, in general, the advice to anyone who's doing this kind of, your property manager is a key component, right? So we get a deal in, we just ignore the expense numbers. And, and frankly, sometimes even the income, we just call up our property manager and go, here's a deal we're looking at what do you think, right? How do you think you can operate, uh, how, how you can operate this? What do you think the target rents are? Now, a lot of times 
we already kind of know what the what the rules of thumb are for expenses, right? So just by, by looking at other deals, maybe by getting into a deal, by talking with the proper manager. So we also, we tend to have the per unit cost for buildings like this in a certain geography. And they vary widely. Like in Memphis, it might be $3,300 a, a unit um, uh, per, per year that we're spending expenses. And then, you know, a Dallas might be like $4,200, right? So it really depends, but they're they're roughly accurate, right? So when we get a pro forma in, in Memphis with $2,500 per unit, you know, you're kind of going, yeah, that's low. We're going to use $3,300, right? Now, um, and then you look at the, the, the rent numbers and you can quickly apply some rules of thumbs and you can come up very quickly with a, you know, with an offer price without having to do too much work. I actually call that, uh, I have something called a 10 minute offer. It's a technique that allows you to make an offer very quickly without spending a whole bunch of time calling, researching and Googling stuff. Um, that allows you to make an offer to see if uh, if there's any kind of motivation there. And you stay away from section eights and section forty twos. No, not necessarily. Okay. So what's what's your play when we're dealing with the government and subsidized rent? It also depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on a deal, and it depends a lot on your on your property manager, right? So so a, a you know if you if you have a section eight um, section eight asset. It, you, you need a, a property manager that specializes in that. It's the same thing for okay, student housing. Okay. So okay. it's not that student housing is any worse or better. It's different. You can't, you can't get a, a conventional property manager to manage student housing or Section 8 housing. You need someone that's got experience, not only to, to deal with the compliance part of it, but also they have, for example, Section 8, they have relationships with all of the agencies and the programs in the city, right? And that's how they get their tenants. And, uh, and so there's not, it's just different. You just have to make sure that your property manager specializes in that kind of asset. Michael, and re regarding the future, where do you see yourself, your, yourself and your company heading? It sounds like you're getting a lot of deal flow. You're getting not knocking some deals on what's next for you. How, how do you see your company heading now? Well, my goal is to provide is to help it is to help people do their first deal. Uh, and to help investors, connecting investors with uh, a good yield, which is really hard to, hard to find, right? So I think we're on track to do about 1,000 units uh, over the next uh, 12 months. And who knows where to go after that? I mean, if, if we can do 1,000 units in the next 12 months, then maybe, you know, there's 10,000 units in the future for in five years. Who knows, right? So we're just, we're just trying to kind of uh, 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 stay ahead of, of, of the game and put programs into place that is appealing to the syndicator on the one hand, and then the investors on the other hand, and then connecting the two together. And re regarding books, because you know I'm a, I'm a bookworm, what have you been reading lately that you like to share with our listeners? Oh my gosh. <clears throat> Actually, I, I'm not even reading any, uh, what was it? Um, I read so many books. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let me think one for your audience. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't, I don't know about, I, there's a book I read uh, by, uh, recently by, um, by Stephen Cook called Life and Air. And so my mission is to help people become financially free. And that's uh, both the syndicator who doesn't have money, but wants to use multifamily as a way to quit their job, replace your income, as well as the high net worth individual who wants to put their money to work so they don't have to work anymore or, or less, right? This, this is exactly the same. Now, Steve Book's Life, Life and Air approaches it from a light, slightly different angle. And he talks about becoming financially free a little bit from a mindset perspective. So instead of dreaming about the life you want to have someday, what can you do today to live the life that you want, right? So just a basic example, you know, I want a vacation house. That's what I really want, okay? Uh, but I'm going to have to save for the next five to 10 years to afford this vacation house. Well, can you get that experience in some way right now so you can have the life you want right now? Well, maybe you can rent a house every once in a while. Wouldn't that be much more affordable? Or I want a boat or something. Well, why don't you just charter a boat every once in a while? Much more affordable. You don't have to buy it. Do you need to buy your own boat? Right? So things like that, uh, making decisions around your expenses. Is there anything you can do with your expenses? Do you need to live the life you have right now? Or could you maybe live a simpler life so you can get to your goal faster? So it really looks at financial freedom from a, for a mental perspective. And I felt, I interviewed him on a podcast, if you can combine that, that mindset shift on the one hand, coupled with a multifamily investment on the other to actually accelerate the replacement of your income, you put the two together, you can achieve your goal a lot faster. And finally, where can I get a hold of you if they have any further questions? Yeah, the, uh, my, my website is the Michael Blanc, that's T-H-E, Michael, B-L-A-N-K.com. And that's where I have all of my free resources, uh, articles, blogs, YouTube video, podcasts. So if you're interested in learning more about multifamily, either as a syndicator or as a 
a passive investor, it might be a great way to start. So, Michael also also has a, a great tool called um, called the Deal Analyzer. You go check it out. It's a wonderful tool. I use it a lot, and you you can learn a lot from from this this tool. Michael, it was a wonderful having you with us today. Hope to speak with you soon. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.